Thank you very much, uh, Colonel Gill, and it's good to be back again with the ITVP officers uh, at their senior command management course. And today I'm going to speak to you on uh, India and global centers of power. Uh, and I want to begin by stating the obvious that uh, the world, generally speaking, has moved between multipolarity, bipolarity, and at times unipolarity. And that is the broad context in which we should examine the current situation. Now, if we look as a frame at a, as, at a, at a frame of reference, uh, we can take uh, the end of the Second World War. And we see that uh, the end of the war gave rise to the United Nations as uh, a body devoted to the maintenance of international peace and security. And that within that August body, there was a UN Security Council of five members, permanent members of the UN Security Council. And one might say that that showed that there is a certain multipolar structure uh, which was available at the end of 1945. But very soon thereafter, those that were allies began to have problems, particularly the United States and the USSR began to have problems and it descended into Cold War politics. The Cold War politics of that era ensured that the UN Security Council itself became very much divided, a divided house. China, for instance, was part of the allies, loosely speaking, that had emerged as victors at the end of the Second World War. And it was also the only Asian country representing the large mass of population that exists in Asia. 60% of the global population lives in Asia. So by the time we get to the end of the 1940s, the Cold War is raging. And though the United States and the USSR had cooperated in defeating Germany and Japan and the Axis powers, by then they were themselves caught up in an arms race. There was also a gap that was growing between the Republic of China which was, as I told you, in 1945, not the People's Republic of China, but the Republic of China, which today exists. The so-called Republic of China exists only on Taiwan. And uh, so that Republic of China had not yet found its own place and influence as a major power, but it was already part of the UN Security Council. By 1949, the communists had taken over China and on the mainland replaced the Kuomintang. The Kuomintang led by General Chiang Kai-shek had to flee to Taiwan and re-establish their so-called Republic of China limited to that island. And China, that is to say the People's Republic of China, thereafter remained out of the UN Security Council until Taiwan left the UN Security Council under US pressure in 1971 and the People's Republic of China was brought in as a replacement in the UN Security Council. But by the late 1940s, the Cold War had also ensured that there was a triangular relationship emerging. So from what was at the end of the Second World War, a multipolar structure, gradually became a triangular strategic relationship in which you had the United States of America and its allies. On the one hand, you had the Soviet Union and the East Bloc on the other hand. And then you also had the People's Republic of China, which was not in the Security Council, yet a major communist power. In the United States, there was a fear of communism. This fear of communism called the Red Scare had started in the 1930s itself because 
as communism was growing after the Bolshevik revolution in the USSR after 1917, and as the Communist Party of China had come into being in 1921 and had been progressing quite rapidly in terms of its civil war within China and gaining power gradually, leftist thinking, communist and Marxist thinking had been pervading European thought as well. And in the United States also, in the political spectrum, there was a certain traction for this kind of thinking, which had led to what is called the Red Scare. And there is a period in the 1940s called the period of McCarthyism, in which every effort was made to fight the communists. So US policy was driven by the 1940s by anti-communism, anti-Marxism, and that meant that by the end of that decade, the United States of America was technically against both the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China, which by then had gained power. In the 1950s, especially under President Eisenhower, when the Secretary of State was John Foster Dulles, one saw the continuation of this kind of anti-communism driving US policy. And this continued particularly from 1953 to 1959 under Secretary of State John Foster Dulles. During this period in 1954 and 1955, one also saw the rise of security alliances which were anti-communist in nature, which were backed by the United States of America called CENTO and CETO. CENTO was also called the Central Treaty Organization known as the Baghdad Pact, which was geared towards meeting the challenge of communism in West Asia. And CETO was the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization geared to facing the communist challenge in Southeast Asia. In Southeast Asia, there was a concern because Chinese communism was also spreading towards Southeast Asia. China and the Communist Party were interfering in the internal affairs of countries like especially Thailand and Indonesia, where there were sizable Chinese origin populations. So the point that I'm making here is that the pendulum has been generally swinging between multipolarity to plurality to bipolarity to unipolarity. But the decade of the 1960s and 70s, during the height of the Cold War, one can say, was essentially a global structure driven by bipolarity. And why so? Because the People's Republic of China had not yet become a nuclear power till 1964. The People's Republic of China had not entered the UN Security Council till 1971. And it was also very clear that the People's Republic of China was not a rich country. And that did not happen till its open door and modernization policies, which started only in the late 1970s. And it took another 20 years for China to become fairly rich at the turn of the century. So the 60s and 70s, one can say, were driven by a bipolar structure. And that bipolar structure saw that there was a Western camp and there was an East Bloc camp. There was a NATO and there was the USSR and its allies. And in this situation, the two had military competition, geostrategic competition, but did not have what you call trade and economic relations. They did not have scientific and technological cooperation among themselves. And this is vastly different from the kind of competition that we see today between the People's Republic of China and the United States of America uh, and with the Russian Federation having aligned with China. I'll explain that in due course. So by the time the 60s and the 70s pass, bipolarity is causing the United States some concern. The Russian 
you know, led Soviet Union is moving rapidly up the path of scientific and technological innovation, militarization. It is uh, acquiring certain advantage in terms of its space power, uh, nuclear weapons, etc. And therefore, the United States goes in for what is called a rebalancing strategy. A rebalancing strategy under which Henry Kissinger, the then Secretary of State, paid a secret visit to China in 1971, arranged by Pakistan. And thereafter, President Nixon went in 1972, and there was a great reset of relations between China and the United States of America. It was geared to meeting the challenge of a dominant and militarized, increasingly militarized Soviet Union. And after that, we also saw how this led to very strong military cooperation, scientific cooperation between the United States and China in the early period. Later, of course, as differences began to emerge, this kind of technical cooperation reduced directly, but indirectly it continued because the Chinese continued to send their students, their scientists to the West for education, for other cooperative programs. And they were also very good at following the adage of beg, buy, borrow, steal. They were very good at stealing technology also. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was in the 1990s a period of unipolarity. So we saw how from 1945 we go from multipolarity to the Cold War of, you know, bipolarity and then to unipolarity in the 1990s where the Soviet Union has collapsed. China has not yet risen to become the big power that it is today. And the United States of America is the sole superpower dominating the global stage. After that, once China entered the WTO in 2001 and normalized trade relations with the rest of the world, it became a very big manufacturing hub for the rest of the world. It became the world's biggest trading nation. It became a very rich nation by having surpluses in trade with just about every country in the world. It began to invest in U.S. Treasury bonds. Even the retirement funds of the United States of America depended on China for their own you know, success. And we reach, therefore, a stage in which unipolarity gradually descends into a new Cold War in which there are suggestions of bipolarity. It is not genuine bipolarity because the U.S. remained the established power, the hegemon, the biggest military power, the biggest economy. But China was rising in the last 20 years, particularly after 2001, China began to claim the title of the world's second largest economy, the second most powerful military, and there were other areas where it was number one. And so there was talk about 10 years ago of what you call a new bipolarity, a G2, a group of two, which would work together just as the United States and the Soviet Union had a geostrategic relationship in which they had to balance each other. So also over the last 10 years, the new caste over there is the United States of America and you have on the other hand, the People's Republic of China. In this, we also see how the European Union has, has its own ups and downs over the last 70 years. Europe itself was devastated at the end of the Second World War. Countries that were regional economic powers, particularly Germany, had been devastated. It had been flattened by the Second World War, by the Allied bombing, by the uh, you know uh, failed attempt to invade the Soviet Union and having lost the war. And in Asia, we had another big power, Japan, which had threatened peace and security and had brought the United States of America on its knees alongside the rest of Asia. That power had also been flattened with atomic bombs. And the U.S. had this 
you know, Marshall Plan for Germany and its own version of a Marshall Plan for the revival of Japan as well. And so through the 50s, Germany is rising in Europe. France is already one of the great victors, already a member of the UN Security Council. In Asia, Japan is also rising again. And over time, the Europeans changed their economic cooperation, which was earlier under the European Economic Community, the EEC, that was, uh, you know, headquartered in um, Brussels, uh, to have a more meaningful political union, monetary union of sorts. And these efforts finally led to the creation of the European Union, a community of roughly 28 countries. In the formation and growth of the EU also as a major economic pole, not a political pole, but not a military pole as much as an economic pole. It also became one of the key power centers in the world, global center of power, but defined differently from the others. And we also saw at this point of time, with the end of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union also meant the freeing of several nations in Europe, which were earlier part of the East Bloc. These East Bloc nations ultimately came under the influence of, on the military side, NATO membership on the, uh, you know, political or economic side under the, you know, sort of uh, attraction and lure, the magnetic pull of the EU. So many of them actually became full-fledged members of the EU. Some of them also became participants in the NATO's defense structures in Europe. Be that as it may, the EU remained a very strong center of power until being challenged again recently by Brexit with the departure of the United Kingdom from the EU. A very strong and potent part of the EU was removed and it left only what we call the continental European landmass available for now 27 countries in the European Union. Within the Union, there are structural weaknesses. Everybody is not equal. In the EU, there is a very big divide between the northern and southern economies. There is still a very big divide between the original West Europeans and the later East Europeans who have joined. As in the case of Germany, which was reunited in 1989, East Germany was the weaker of the two when it joined and became one country again. And gradually, that kind of economic growth within Germany spread to make it more equal. Likewise, in the European Union, there was a gap between the rich countries of the north, like France and Germany, and the poorer countries to the south, like Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal. Similarly, there was a gap between the Western Europeans and the Eastern Europeans, the smaller uh, you know, nations, uh, particularly the Baltic nations, countries like Lithuania, Latvia, these are also not so well developed, but they are now front and center part of the emerging Western alliances there, whether economic, political, or military. It is in this space that the People's Republic of China, which, as I told you, has been growing very rapidly in the last two decades in particular, and generally, more generally over the last 35 years, that China was able to offer its riches to the European countries as well. When there was the global financial and economic crisis in 2007 and 8, in fact, there were two successive global financial and economic crises. It's like saying there were two floods, one on the heels of the other. Those economic and financial crises not only weakened the United States of America, but greatly weakened 
the European Union, especially the economic strength of the, uh, the European Union, which was later further weakened by Brexit and the exit of the UK. At that time, China was able to use its enormous financial riches, its you know, foreign exchange holdings, its trade, its Belt and Road Initiative, and the offer of cheap developmental finance to even acquire some assets like ports and other things in European countries, like the acquisition of the Piraeus port in Greece is an example. It's a strategic investment by China. The acquisition of a port, which can thereafter be used for other strategic purposes also. And China began to influence political decision making in Europe, in certain countries, because they needed Chinese money. They needed China's wealth for their own developmental programs. And so even on parts of the Eurasian landmass, China's influence was creeping in and in Europe as well. And more recently, we have seen that the United States of America and others have woken up to this threat and have even managed to convince some countries not to allow Chinese investment to come in in the same manner. China had also formed a dialogue mechanism called 17 plus 1. That is 17 European countries, many of whom, not all, were members of the EU and China were engaged in a dialogue which resulted in many of them being increasingly dependent on China for their economic prosperity, for their infrastructure and connectivity needs. Recently, Lithuania, which was one such country, walked out of that arrangement of 17 plus 1. And with the departure of Lithuania, it may set the ball rolling for others also to realize the dangers of this kind of an embrace with China in Europe, which may cost them their sovereignty and economic uh, independence. On the other end of the spectrum, the Japanese economy also grew and revived through the 1950s and 60s. Initially, it was basically regarded as a cheap, low cost, low quality economy. But once the Japanese used the feedback to perfect their manufacturing of cars, of electronics, of television sets, by the time we look at Japan in the mid-60s, it has all already emerged as a very big economic power with a huge favorable balance of trade vis-a-vis -vis the United States of America. It has re-emerged as a great power, but not as a political power, not as a military power, but as an economic power. That continues to be the case till today. Although Japan's own outlook is changing with the rise of the threat of China, Japan is also looking at the possibility of becoming a strengthened military power now, not just a political power or an economic or a trading power, superpower that it is, but also through participation in the Indo-Pacific Initiative or the Quad through bilateral exercises with friendly countries and also to, you know, uh, enhance its defense budgets to go in for the capacities necessary to protect its island territories. Japan's own policy orientation is changing and the nature of its power, it being a center of power, but the nature and character of that power is gradually changing towards more independence in military matters, towards a stronger strategic outlook towards the region. So I've broadly painted for you uh, the scenario here. We have seen in the case of Russia that it emerged after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 as the successor state, as the legacy state, and inherited most of the power that was wielded by the Soviet Union. But the situation was vastly different from the Cold War 
that existed between the United States and the Soviet Union, because as I told you, they were competing militarily at the strategic level, at the global level. They had camp followers, they had zones of influence, but they didn't have an economic integration between themselves. The situation today is vastly different. Today we see that there is a United States of America, there is a People's Republic of China. This bipolarity is a situation of great competition and rivalry, but it is also, and they have their own camp followers today. The United States has its allies who are all awakening to the threat of China. The Chinese have also got their camp followers, a large number of Asian and African countries, some European countries also, as I just mentioned, who look up to China as their savior and China's wealth and China's money and China's financing through the uh, Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, or the BRICS New Development Bank. People look to China as well for financing. And yet we find that both China and the United States, unlike the Soviet Union and the United States in the past, are actually integrated economically like Never before. Theirs is the strongest economic relationship. And what is of greater, uh, uh, you know, irony here is that the rest of the world is also economically integrated to both of them. It is in this peculiar situation, unlike in the past, unlike in the Cold War version one, Cold War version two is a more complex scenario in which other countries have to make difficult choices or whether they want to cooperate economically more with the United States on the technological side, would they rather cooperate more with the West in 5G, artificial intelligence, big data, internet of things, quantum physics, or should they go with China? And when they examine their options, they find that they are actually cooperating and integrated with both. They also find that the two who are rivals are also economically integrated like, like never before and are trying their best to reset their own relationship. As you can see, the United States having woken up to the exploitation by China has now put curves. There is what is called the CFIUS, Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States, which examines every case now of Chinese attempts to invest in the United States. Chinese attempts to acquire companies in order to access their technology. Chinese outbound investment is strategic in nature, not just ports and other infrastructure. They even bid for Darwin in Australia. Darwin is the place where the American troops have their OTR. Darwin is the first place where the Americans would put in more troops if they wanted to have better security for the Indo-Pacific. And yet it is in Darwin that the Chinese bid for the port itself, blocked by the Australian authorities just in time. So this is a very peculiar situation in which the rest of the world is forced to take a view on how to engage and how to disengage if required with the various centers of power. For India also, it makes for a very difficult choice because we have seen that our largest trading partner is in fact, you know, the European Union now. A while ago, it used to be, you know, through indirect trade, it used to be the UAE. Or in many counts, one can say that China is one of our largest trading partners as it is for uh, most countries. If we combine goods and services, then the United States of America is also a very large trading partner for us. So it's a very complex world. And having described this complexity to you of the global centers of power over the last 70 years, I've attempted to do it in the last 25 minutes. So it's not very easy uh, in a free flowing manner, but it is in the broad context that we are looking at a changing world, a rapidly changing world today. And this change in which everybody is aspirational. Everybody today wants the best of things. 
in the globalized world, but everybody has not got the best of advantages in a globalized world. Globalization has also had its winners and losers. And the losers are also looking to other options. And in many ways, one can say that China's rise as a, as a global center of power, with many following the Chinese example of what you call state capitalism, but the Chinese narrative of governance and economic decision making, the attraction of that model is greater for those who are losers in the process of globalization so far. Everybody has not benefited. Many have gamed the globalization process in a manner in which they have taken the advantages and many have got left behind. China itself has gamed that system. It has successfully strategically played this game very well of initially giving the impression of completely accepting Western structures like the Bretton Woods, uh, you know, financial decision-making structures, World Bank, IMF, etc., and cooperating with them, entering the WTO, becoming very big. And now that China is big, it's in a position to challenge some aspects of the global structures which do not suit its requirements while supporting those aspects of the current global structures which actually enable China to rise to the top, which is United Nations, membership of the UN Security Council. These are greatly favored by China because they've allowed China to rise to the top. WTO, even in health uh, you know, matters, WHO, etc., China has tried to stage a comeback in trading uh, arrangements like the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership in the Asia-Pacific region. China is the biggest economy. So these are what you call the existing traditional characteristics of the global decision-making structures, whether political or economic. And China is very much part of that, favors its own centrality, its participation there. In fact, during the Trump era, when the United States, despite being the world's biggest power, was withdrawing itself from multilateral organizations. It was China that was stepping in and claiming to the rest of the world that we are a responsible power. Look at the United States. They are foregoing their responsibility with regard to climate change, with regard to health uh, matters. They are withdrawing from uh, all sorts of trading agree agreements like the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, but here is China, a responsible power, willing to do its bit in regard to climate change, in regard to the WHO, in regard to you know the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, etc. So China, let me put it this way, in its emergence as a center of power, has also gamed the system. It has supported the existing structures to the extent that they have proved advantages to China and questioned uh, structures and sought to establish some new China-centric structures to the extent that they did not meet China's aspirations. The example that I can give is the setting up of the uh, Asian Infrastructure and Investment uh, Bank, AIIB, in which China is the biggest stakeholder. Of course, India is also uh, a founding member of the AIIB, as are many others. In the BRICS New Development Bank also, China is one of the bigger st stakeholders. And these structures are aimed at meeting the financial connectivity, infrastructure development needs of developing countries, much more than what the IMF and the World Bank are capable of giving. In many ways, the traditional structures like the IMF and World Bank are seen as more intrusive because they link the provision of aid and assistance or loans with scrutiny of governance, scrutiny of human rights, which the AIIB and the new development bank of BRICS led by major powers in which China is you know, a major stakeholder. And these are not European powers. 
they don't have the United States of America in them. These are more easygoing, so to speak, where developmental finance is, is not linked to governance. So these are the new structures which China has sought to create. The competition between the United States and China has been going on for some time now, more particularly after the two global financial and economic crises proved that the United States and Europe were getting weakened. The traditional engines of global economic growth had begun to shift to Asia even earlier. By the 1990s, it was clear that China was emerging as a manufacturing hub. United States, European economies, all of them were chasing greater profits by shifting their manufacturing plants to China where there was an abundant supply of cheap labor. Low cost manufacturing meant that they would make more profits. There was also the great attraction of an emerging large domestic market in China as prosperity grew. That great expectation that the Chinese market itself means profits for global companies. And so a good decade before the financial and economic crisis also, the global engines of economic growth had shifted towards Asia, in Asia primarily to China. The global financial and economic crisis of 2007 and 8 made it doubly clear that the West was weakened, that China was resurgent, and it was not affected by the financial and economic crisis. And after that, you can see that China has been more aggressive in demonstration of its identity as a global center of power by actually claiming a seat at the high table backed by its economy, backed by its foreign exchange reserves, and eventually after the arrival of Xi Jinping, backed by the Belt and Road Initiative as well. That competitive scenario between the United States of America and a rising People's Republic of China was already there when the COVID pandemic struck. And the COVID pandemic struck at a time when Trump, President Trump was always, already involved in a, a very competitive rivalry with China. He had already identified China as a competitor, as a rival, as a revisionist power alongside the Russian Federation. And for the US, it became more difficult because this time around, it was China and the Russian Federation, two great centers of power, traditional power that were coming together. Again, we saw the emergence of a triangular global strategic uh, relationship. This time around, the external balancing was different. If earlier China and the US had come together to deal with a powerful Soviet Union in the 1970s and 80s. This time round, it was the United States up against a weak Russia that saw benefit in coming close to China. And China saw great benefit in taking the Russian Federation closer to itself because Russia, despite being weak, remained an enormously successful scientific and military power. Not only that, it's also one of the world's two biggest nuclear powers. And so China saw benefit in that kind of a balancing in order to deal with US pressure. The US began to look elsewhere. The US also had to rebalance in this emerging triangularity. And where would it go? Because it could not yet go to Japan alone or to Germany alone because both these powers can be questionable in terms of reliability and I will tell you why. Left alone, Japan as I told you was only an economic power, a great global economic power but it was not ready to militarize itself because of domestic public opinion, also not ready to take on a confrontationist position vis-a-vis -vis the threat of China. It was beginning to feel the pressure of nuclearization in North Korea, but not quite ready to go about militarizing itself on its own 
and taking on adversaries. Japan is a power that can do so more in tandem with others in a more subtle way, maintaining a low profile, keeping its options open. And so the United States could only do so much with Japan, with which it had a security relationship, a treaty alliance. It then looks at Germany. Germany by, you know, then, and especially under Merkel, had become uh, a fairly, how shall I say, uh, idiosyncratic independent power in terms of its decision making. Germany had developed a very different kind of relationship with the Russian Federation. Germany's dependence on Russia's energy was unique. Germany was not willing to shell out the extra money for support of the poorer southern European powers, as suggested by the United States. In order to keep the Chinese away, somebody in Europe had to help the poorer Europeans more so that they would not go to China for money. Germany was also reluctant to spend more on its defense. Very difficult to get Germany to spend more in terms of per capita, you know, GDP, percentage of GDP on defense, though it was part of NATO. But it tended to take a more independent line, not only towards the Russian Federation, but also towards China. Germany had developed a great liking under Merkel for China. This made Germany also a difficult option for the United States strategy for rebalancing. And so in this kind of a situation, what emerges is also India. India in the last 20 years also showed that it was capable of growing very rapidly. Its long-term prospects are still very good. In 2001 or 2002, I recall that the BRICS at that time, it was only BRIC. South Africa joined BRICS in 2009 and attended the first meeting in 2010. Before that, it was BRIC, B-R-I-C. S for South Africa was not there. It was only Brazil, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Of these, two economies are traditionally seen as commodity-driven, Brazil and Russia. And two are seen as more dynamic, India being traditionally seen as a more dynamic economy with regard to IT and other knowledge-based industries, and China seen as the more dynamic in terms of manufacturing capability. But in that context, the economists of the West, of Goldman Sachs, had stated very clearly that of all these four economies, the only one which has the prospects of continuing to grow at high rates of growth of 5% and above till the middle of this century is India. Why did he say that way back 20 years ago? Because Brazil and China sorry, Brazil and uh, Russia were seen as commodity-driven markets and were unlikely to be able to sustain that because commodity markets are very fickle. They have cycles, typically, which are roughly seven-year cycles in which there is either growth or slump. In the case of China, China was also seen as a country that is aging. China, as is clear today, has run out of cheap labor, China has progressed up the value chain. Cost of living has gone up. Cost of labor has gone up. Countries that came to China in the hope of acquiring the benefit of low cost manufacturing, what is called labor arbitrage, is no longer possible in China. Therefore, many countries are also relocating out of China to other cheaper alternatives like Vietnam, like Thailand, and in the last 20 years, many others emerged as alternatives. Alternative centers of economic growth in Asia, not just China, 
but the Philippines began to show high growth rates, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and as growth was shifting to the rest of Asia, the emergence of India was also acknowledged by all. India also grew quite rapidly over the last 20 years as compared to the so-called growth rates, what they referred to uh, earlier as Hindu growth rate, whatever that means. But in the last 20 years, that pejorative term is no longer being used uh, for India. There is no such suggestion of a complacent economic growth rate. And India has also shown that the BRICS prediction of Goldman Sachs is actually still quite true after the pandemic, beyond the pandemic, as China ages, as China lifts the limits on family planning in its own country. Today, China has, since 2016, allowed two-child policy. One-child policy was imposed in 1979. It was discontinued in 2016. And today, in 2021, China has finally lifted that control also. People can have three children now in China because they need new manpower, human resources to drive their own growth through uh, the next 20 years, 30 years, and also to look after an aging population. So we have seen that apart from the US, whose power has waxed and waned between being part of multipolar structure in 1945 to becoming part of a bipolar world in the late 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s to becoming a unipolar power in the 1990s to now having to share power with an emerging China. And in this broad scenario, the EU has also waxed and waned in terms of its own power. I explained to you how Brexit took some of its strength away, how Germany's independent policies have also questioned the unity and ability of the EU to function as a strategic pole with clear-cut goals and objectives. And I explained to you how Japan, reluctant to show all its cards independently, is still very much part of a security umbrella in Asia and now ramping up its militarization through multipolar structure like the Quad, greater participation in the Malabar, greater participation at the bilateral level. Russia's own path has been mixed from the all-powerful Soviet Union to becoming a legacy state to now having to play second fiddle to the People's Republic of China, even in its own backyard. In Central Asia, which the Russians regard as their near abroad, in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which has great strategic interests in Central Asia, particularly in regard to extremism, radicalization, and terrorism, the three great evils which Xi Jinping has codified in some of his statements. The Chinese seem to be wielding more power even in that near abroad backyard of the Russian Federation, more so because of the dependence that's been created in Central Asia by China's Belt and Road Initiative. And yes, yet Russia has decided to throw in its lot with China at this stage because of the pressure that the West, particularly the United States, puts on Russia with regard to interference in its internal affairs, as in alleged interference by Russia in US elections, the issue of human rights in Russia, democracy in Russia, the imprisonment of opposition leader Navalny, Russia's takeover of Crimea, its ongoing enmity with Ukraine, its other you know, problems in uh, North Caucasus, its uh, military uh, you know, incursions in uh, Georgia. And so Russia is a different uh, kettle of fish in the near future, likely to stick with China in order to better deal with the West. And China, likewise, in the near term, more likely to stick together with Russia to deal with the West.
the United States, meanwhile, more likely to ramp up its relations with countries in the Indo-Pacific, not only traditional treaty alliance partners like Japan and Australia, but also new partners like India, major defense partner, non-NATO uh, ally, as we are described to be. We have the largest number of exercises today with the United States of America, whether it is Yudh Abhyan or anything else, we are exercising special forces, army, navy, air force. We have a two plus two dialogue going on today as we speak in Washington. And we are really integrated with them with the latest uh, uh, foundational agreements having been signed, the last one being Beka. Before that, we have concluded Leboa, uh, Komkasa, uh, Gisomia. We concluded the Industrial Security Annex, which is uh, uh, also an extension of the 2002 uh, Gisomia uh, Agreement. All this makes for a very complex uh, future. So I have broadly tried to give you, without going into too many petty details of trade figures and you know things like that, I wanted to tell you the big story. What is the big picture in the world today over the last 70 years? In this, India remains an important pole, an important center of power, both maritime and economic. We have our own challenges. We have to deal with them ourselves. But we have good relations with the United States and with Russia. Russia still exports a lot of defense equipment to us. 60% of our imports still come from the Russian Federation, though in the last decade or so, we have ramped up our offtake from the United States. Since 2008, we must have ordered something like $20 billion worth of equipment from the US. And we have, as you know, even now ordered the S-400 system, braving the threat of sanctions by the United States in order to better defend our airspace and our territory. So we are invested in Russia in terms of our stakes in Sakhalin, in the energy projects there, roughly five to six billion dollars. We have the Russians having invested something like eight billion dollars in India, including in the SR refinery, the single largest investment by any country in the world in India's energy sector is by the Russians. I think I should stop there. Thank you.